Good morning, compost heap. Do you want some eggshells and onion skins? Who wants some eggshells and onion skins? Sit. Sit. Actually, I guess all you do is sit, right? Okay, here's your eggshells and onion skins. No, that's all you get. Go lie down. You're so cute. Okay, you can have a banana peel and some wet paper towel. Okay, you can have a human head. A human head? What are you thinking? I know you can break it down, but where did you even get that idea? Game of Thrones? Who let you watch Game of Thrones? Okay, let's just get some things straight here. You're a collection of organic matter being decomposed and digested by aerobic bacteria and worms and bugs. You do not have consciousness. You cannot vote in elections or participate in the Academy Awards. So... No, I will not get you Springsteen tickets. We obviously have some things to iron out. Meanwhile, here's a show about all the ways compost can touch your life and afterlife. And now he put a maraschino cherry in the compost heap in 1964, and it's still good as new. Colin McEnroe. That that cherry is as red and shiny as the day it was born. Uh, But that tells you more about maraschino cherries than it does about compost heaps. We're going to talk about compost today, and we're going to talk about compost in myriad forms and contexts. Uh, We're going to tell you about the state's uh, new law uh, that affects sort of large-scale compost operations. Uh, We're going to tell you uh, also about uh, what happens if you want to compost but don't really have the time or the inclination to uh, maintain and become friends with, as Kayone did, uh, an actual compost heap, uh, how you could actually have that happen for you. We're also going to talk to you a little bit, tell you a little bit about who visits your compost heap if you do have one. Uh, There's one experiment uh, here in Connecticut where they're setting up cameras near compost heaps so you can see what kind of wildlife goes in there and what it looks for. Um, We'll also tell you towards the end of the show about um, a brand new operation just about to kind of go uh, live in the next week or so uh, after about a 10 or 15 year run up uh, that will allow people to participate in composting in a very final way. Uh, in other words, apply all of the principles, chemistry, and science of compost to the final destination of the human body so that you wind up instead of in a sort of typical grave- graveyard, you wind up more as kind of gardening material uh, in a very special kind of graveyard. So, anyway. All of that is uh, still to come. Uh, we also welcome your questions. We'd love to get some phone calls as we go along here. 860-275-7266. That's 860-275-7266. You may tweet us at WNPR Colin. Our tweet master, Greg Hill, is in the house for that. He will tweet back at you. WNPR Colin. Do follow us there. All right. So uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover here. And we're going to begin, I think, maybe with uh, the fact that Connecticut has um, a law on the books, a relatively new law on the books that I think um, Casey Alexander, well, let me just say whoever who's here. That'd be good, too. Uh, Susanna Castle is here with us. She runs Blue Earth, Earth Compost. She's the person who comes to your house and picks up your compost. If you don't want to have your own compost, he, Chris Field is vice president of Harvest New England. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about uh, him and his operation and what it, that's all about in just a second. Casey Alexander is an organics researcher recycling specialist with the Connecticut DEEP recycling program. So Casey Alexander, this law that Connecticut has on the books, I don't know if it's one of a kind exactly uh, nationally, but it is being cited anyway as as pretty groundbreaking legislation in terms of getting um, getting some <clears throat> mandatory collection, excuse me, of compostable materials off the ground. Uh, it is actually. Um, the, the real purpose for the law was to spur development for more facilities where food scrap can be taken to get recycled. Um, So what it says is that um, certain businesses that generate large quantities of uh, food scrap, and we're talking like 104 tons a year, um, and um, who are within 20 miles of a facility that can accept that waste, are going to have to separate that waste out from the rest of their solid waste and get it recycled. Um, So... This has really been, I think we were one of the first in the country, if not the first. And by doing that, we are hopefully um, encouraging facilities to locate here. We're guaranteeing those facilities some measure of feedstock to make their facilities operate efficiently. And in doing so, we'll get more facilities and be able to compost more. Um, Connecticut was the first state, um, at least in the Northeast, to pass this kind of law, and we were followed by Massachusetts and Vermont and New York City, and just last week, Rhode Island uh, introduced their bill. Um, But the the takeaway is that 
and even though all these states are going about it in slightly different ways and we have slightly different language in our laws, um, the collective message from the Northeast region is that we know that food waste um, and food scrap recycling is, is important, uh, so important that um, we're passing laws to mandate that it happen. And, and so, I mean, we, we're, we're kind of operating on a whole bunch of different fronts here. On the one hand, yeah, we want to get this stuff out of our landfills so it's not clogging our landfills. Uh, we also want to use it uh, much more naturally and get it kind of back into the ecosystem. Uh, that's a good thing, too. As you're suggesting, it also seems to be understood as a spur to economic development if you can actually get the right kinds of facilities here. Uh, to do the recycling. And then, you know, somewhere down the line, uh, a lot of states, including Connecticut, are thinking, I think, about energy generation in a really different way, too. And we think of energy de- generation from waste products, we're thinking of trash to energy where it's burned. But really, what's being contemplated here is using the science of compost to make energy, right? Correct. Um, some of the facilities uh, that have been talking with us are anaerobic digesters. And um, these are facilities that can take the food waste, um, digest it anaerobically without oxygen, drive off the gas, make electricity from that, and then compost the digestate that's left and return that to the soil. So it is a win-win, and it'll, it'll help with our um, our solid waste management planning, with our climate action change plan, our energy plan, and, and our clean energy portfolio. So, so yeah, we're hoping that uh, we can attract some of those facilities, and we've gotten some good news. We've we've gotten uh, one application into the department already for such a facility, and we're expecting another one soon. So it's really like a win, 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 win. I think there's at least four wins. Yes, win, a lot of in, wins. In there, lots of wins. So, um, uh, you know, just uh, to, to, to now go over to, to Chris Field from uh, Harvest New England, uh, you're not uh, in the business of making energy out of compost, but you are in the business of making compost, right? Tell us about your operation. Well, actually, Harvest itself is a, a large company which does, do, which does operate anaerobic digestion uh, facilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've run three of them, one in Orlando, one in... Toronto, and I mean one in uh, Ontario and one in Vancouver. What we do in Connecticut is we have a f- food waste composting facility in Ellington, where food waste is a small percentage of the m- total material that we compost there, but it's an important part, and we're seeing a uh, lot, lot more interest in that service as a result of the new law. And so if I went to your uh, place in Ellington, what would I see? What, what's there? You'd see rows and rows of of organic matter in, diff- in uh, different stages of decay. Mm-hmm. And so, Rosen, uh, first of all, I can't wait to go out and see that. But um, second of all, um, the rows and rows of organic m- m- matter, it's not all stuff that you get from restaurants and pasta companies and grocery stores and stuff like that, right? That kind of stuff has to be mixed with other kinds of stuff. Exactly. So to say a little bit more about that. So food waste com- most of the food waste that we're getting is coming from grocery stores, comes in on a traditional uh, t- traditional garbage truck, it's dumped down, and we mix it with other materials that we have on the site, specifically materials high in carbon such as leaves and wood chips. We then put those, that mixture into rows, turn it periodically. The, bio, the, the microorganisms that are present in the material do the work, break it down, and turn it into a f- finished compost. But you've got to turn it occasionally too, right? Correct. You turn it, and that that introduces oxygen back into the into the piles as the microorganisms deplete the oxygen. Now um, we're going to talk in just a second uh, to somebody about the actual science of composting. But what do we know about composting? Is um, that it produces a tremendous amount of heat if it's being done right, if it's happening well. Temperatures get up uh, above 140 degrees Fahrenheit in, in some piles. Is that happening there? I mean, when you, in other words, when you turn this pile, are you exposing a pretty hot inner core? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then the great thing about the getting w- once you get the heat up in that the range you're talking about, we, we're killing weed seeds. So yeah. we're able to produce a finished compost that doesn't have weed seeds. Uh, Susanna Castle told me a story about the crows. So tell me the story about the crows. The crows? She said that when you guys turn the compost pile, sometimes the crows come down just to get warm, to sit on it. Right, right. We like stories like that. Well, it's not something we're trying to promote. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we're, we're not, we're, we're, we're a compost. You're not, running, you're not running a crow sauna. No, we're not saying. running a crow's resort either. So um, the, the, we're glad that the crows like it, but it's not something we're really encouraging. No. Well, I, I don't think they listen to the show or anything like that. I wouldn't be worried that more of them are going to do it as a result of this uh, conversation. But it's kind of a lovely image, anyway, of creating all this heat. And then the crows, who apparently have very cold bottoms at this time of year, 
go and sit down and get a little warmth. Uh, all right, so, uh, but he, he clearly doesn't want the clerk doing this. Um, all right, so um, uh, let me just talk a little bit to, about the science. Well, I won't talk about the science of composting, but before we uh, meet Susanna, who's going to come to your house in the near future, if you want her to, and collect your compostables, but before we get to that, uh, let's uh, talk uh, to uh, Jean Bonnetel. Uh, she is uh, director of Cornell Waste Management Institute in Ithaca, New York. Welcome to the show. Hi. How are you? Yeah, we're just fine. So, you know, we're talking a little bit about sort of what happens in the composting process, but it might be worthwhile just to take a moment and really kind of talk about the science of composting. So uh, what actually goes on in, in a big compost pile? Well, you have both carbon and nitrogen, and those carbonaceous and nitro nitrogenous wastes combine and they start breaking down. And basically, in a compost pile, we're trying to keep microorganisms happy. So the microorganisms are the workers, and the more work that those microorganisms do, the less work that the humans have to do. So if we balance our carbon and nitrogen well and our moisture, and we mix and size reduce some of those materials, then the composting process takes over. If we had a very, very, very hot compost, we might kill some of those microbes off, and then we'd have a compost that wasn't working very well. But we like our compost to work uh, between 120 and 150 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. If uh, Chris, if it's getting too hot, is there something you can do about that? Because she's saying you don't want to kill off all kinds of good things that are in there. We would generally turn or add water. It depends on the feedstocks that we're working with. All right. We turn it because we, we take temperatures. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So, um, and so what we have here, here are several different classes of bacteria, right, Gene? And, and then in most compost piles, it's also um, a bunch of sort of they're, – they're doing what's sometimes called chemical decomposition, and then there's sort of physical decomposition, right? There's worms, right. there's bugs and stuff like that. Talk about right. that. Um, there, there's a myriad of microorganisms that are in there. They're, they're microscopic and macroscopic, and they all are working in concert basically to break down that material. All of them have a different place in the pile. All of them want different things from the pile, and so they all uh, tend to work together pretty well. And the temperatures, those high temperatures, will uh, kill the pathogenic organisms that we don't want to be in the compost process. Uh, it all sounds great. We're going to talk more about this. And by the way, if people have questions, really, I, 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 there will not be a compost question that one of these people cannot answer. So 860-STUMP the compost panel, 860-275-7266, 860-275-7266. Also, you may tweet us at WNPR. Colin, we'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about a service that comes to your house and takes your stuff away so you don't have to mess around with the compost heap. When you plant and grow like in the last song It's just composting From the kitchen there Seems so grown But an air sandwich in the soil I grow Our vegetation Our vegetation Grass and greens for life do you compost, and do you think it's important to compost? I got a compost pile in the backyard where I put my dead vegetation and leaves. No, it just seems like it would be a messy, smelly type of endeavor that I'm not interested in doing. I do. I grew up, both my parents were really into it and did it a lot. I think it's good. You don't have to fill up the landfill and stuff with dead bushes and whatnot. Uh, if I thought it was important, I'd probably do it. All right, those are some uh, voices from the streets or from the piles or, or something like that, correct, collected by Jackie Lopper and Skylar Magnoli, uh, two of our interns. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. We are hearing from you about compost. One of the things we want to talk about right now is uh, you and your house, uh, for, especially in terms of what you can and can't compost in, in your house. For example, during that promo, I found myself wondering, can you compost schmooze? I know you can compost food. Can you compost schmooze from the food schmooze? Uh, those kinds of questions can be answered, uh, maybe not that particular one. Uh, and we have Susanna Castle here to talk a little bit about her, her company, Blue Earth Compost. Um, actually, maybe even before we, we talk to Susanna in the studio, uh, we'll um, play. We, we actually met Susanna a couple of days ago. And if you, if you think compost isn't a very romantic topic, when we first met Susanna, she was a little worried, a little pressed for time because she was celebrating her anniversary. And we thought, well, that's pretty 
terrible that we're making her talk about compost on her anniversary. It turned out to be her six-month anniversary. That's how romantic she is, and she's in the compost business. All right, let's hear a little visit uh, that Susanna made to my house and my kitchen. Okay, we're standing in my kitchen right now, and uh, we've got, um, I've saved a little bit of waste. We just peeled some uh, clementines, so, and we got a banana peel from this morning. Fruit peels, I assume, are really good, right? Fruit peels are great. One thing about that peel before you toss it in the yeah. compost pail instead of the trash can is you want to make sure to remove the sticker. The little sticker, mm -hmm. the little Del Monte sticker that makes it clear it's from a multinational corporation that probably did something really horrible to create this banana and meddled in the government in the country that it's based in. And that's just because it won't compost? Correct. Yeah. So labels have got to come off. Okay, so we've got a little bag here. I just saved like last night's stuff. I can already see some things that crept in there that probably shouldn't. Somehow or other, that piece of paper got in there. That's not good, right? What is that? That was tied to some bread, all right? Again, with a twist tie that has twist metal tie. and bits like that that you don't want to include in your compost mm. pail. But basically, so we've got a lot of green matter here, a lot of like just leftover tops of things and scallions. and Oh, so somebody dumped this last night's salad in there. Is that okay, the salad that has dressing on it? Yeah, chickpeas. Okay. Fats and oils are fine to include um, in smaller quantities, and you certainly don't want them hot uh, because the compost pails that I provide are lined with a compostable bag, and hot liquids will actually melt that bag. It's made out of plant resins that are designed to break down in a compost pile, and they will melt. Okay, so don't put anything hot in. So other than that, we were, we're pretty okay for compost here, right? Yeah, you we got, got some... chickpeas, tomatoes, apple peels, all that can go. All right, so looks like we're okay in here because I wanted to make some more solid waste and because maybe somebody wanted some coffee. I just made some coffee. Coffee grounds, I assume, are super compostable? Compostable, yeah. They are. They're fantastic. They're a great input. They really speed up the processing of the compost pile itself. And are there other things that are really bad to have go in the compost? Obviously, we don't want staples and metal products. Are there other things that could be really bad for compost? Well, anything that doesn't belong in the compost pile gets pushed to the outside of the pile during the processing. Mm -hmm. just happens naturally. And then the folks at Harvest will actually go through and hand pick out anything that doesn't belong. Um, but really, you don't want to put any metals, plastics, anything that can be recycled doesn't belong in the pile. In general, I mean, what are people telling you about why they're electing your service? A lot of my subscribers are uh, young families and they want to teach their kids about uh, reducing their waste and doing other things with their food scraps besides sending them into the trash. Mm. They want to do the right thing and they've tried composting before and either it hasn't worked or they've attracted critters or they just don't have the time. Mm. So because the service really makes things easy, it's something that they really want to do. Okay. Hey, bring the bucket over here and let's uh, sort of get a sense of sort of what we're, what we're dealing with here in terms of the high-tech equipment uh, we'd be using here. So this here. is the bucket. Yeah. It's four gallons mm -hmm. and it's got a airtight lid. Mm -hmm. And this is a little card that I provide folks when they get started with the service of what can be composted and what can't. Oh, yeah. And so that makes it really easy for folks to track what belongs in the pail and what doesn't. So no dental floss, Q-tips, baby wipes, cigarette butts, styrofoam, wax paper. Those are all bad things. All those are no-nos. Yeah. And uh, hair, pet fur, pet waste, animal remains, none of that. Correct. All right. Because Ralph here could keel over at any moment. We don't want to put him in the compost heap. And then, But pizza boxes are okay. Wow, really? Yeah, exactly. Um, so as long as they get shredded first, again, they're that paper, that bulky waste that's a okay carbon input to add to the pile. And parchment or baking paper, not other kinds of paper. Soiled food paper. Right, like a, muffin wrappers and things like that. Yeah. Paper napkins and paper towels? Those are okay. Obviously, if you're running out of room in your compost pail, right. if they're clean enough and they're undyed paper towels, they can probably be recycled. So that's a better place for them to go. And it gets back to creating a really high-quality finished compost product. Are there, I'm just looking around this kitchen. I mean, there are, so there are, there are more things in, in this kitchen than I would have guessed you could compost because I was thinking mainly in just in terms of things that go in my mouth but it really is it's a lot of these paper products and stuff like that could be composted so that's very cool right yeah it's a great thing to do to put those things to compost instead of in the trash yeah that's Susanna Castle on a visit to my kitchen by the way Ralph is my superannuated dog that's who we were talking about he didn't keel over though so we didn't 
Uh, it could happen any day, though. Uh, our number, 860-275-7266. Before we find out a little bit more about Susanna and her business, just while I'm thinking about it, so Chris Field, she's talking about uh, the big piles at Harvest and how uh, things kind of work their way to the to the outside. So I, I almost hesitate to ask. I mean, what do you find in the compost heap that's not compost? Main issue, the main issue we have is with plastic. Mm. Um, w- the our supplier, the people who are bringing us material, we're, we're very careful to work with them to really clean up their feedstock. Some of the material that comes into us is just incredible how clean it is, especially Whole Foods does a f- phenomenal job. Mm. So it's, it's mainly plastic that, that, that's a problem. But really, the enemy of a successful compost, food waste and compost program is contamination. And as, it, as, the, as food waste composting grows, Everybody's going to have to work really hard to make sure that it comes in, co- go, goes to the facilities in a clean, clean, because it's a lot harder to get it out than it is to keep it out. When we say clean and contamination, what are we talking about? Material that doesn't compost. Okay, um, so we're not talking specifically about sort of dog waste, and I mean, obviously, you don't want that stuff either. But you know, um, but all kinds of condam- contamination. Um, so let me, just, let me just go over to Susanna for a second here. So explain what your business is now. For um, a monthly charge, you will come to somebody's house and take all their compost away, right? Exactly. We make it really easy for folks to do something else with their food scraps besides throw them in the trash. And how many areas are you serving right now? Right now we just serve Hartford and West Hartford. Yeah. And this stuff goes to Chris's facility? Is that where it goes? It does. I take it out once a week to Ellington, and the folks out there are fantastic. Um I have a spot where I drop it under a hoop bin where it's protected from weather, and then they have folks that come and put it in the piles where it belongs, um, and then it gets rotated up to the front once it processes. And you're also working with a, sc- a school program here in Hartford. Explain that. This is fascinating. I have a pilot project at Hartford um, Breakthrough Magnet School, their North Campus, and I work with a kindergarten class of about 12 students. And um, their teacher, Courtney Thompson, contacted me and wanted to do a community engagement service project with her classroom. And she thought um, working with us would be a great way to do that. So I service them just like I service any of my households. But uh, once a month, I go in and talk to the class about what they're learning and what kinds of things that they're um, planning to do with the compost when they get it back in the spring when our, when we do our compost delivery. They're also working it into their curriculum. So I weigh what I take away from their classroom each week, and they chart and graph um, the measurements so they can see, um, you know, numerically – what the um, what the realities are of of what they don't eat at their snacks every day, and even if you're just domestic customers, your non school customers, your average household, they at a certain point uh, in the year they'll get some compost back from you, right? Yeah, um, about six times a year, I will do a community compost delivery, and um, it's based on the amount that uh, folks collect each week, and if. They um, don't have any need for finished compost. If they live in an apartment building, then I will donate it on their behalf to um, community organizations. Um, we got a lot of uh, people calling up with questions. So I want to get to all that in just a second. But uh, somebody tweeted to us, uh, Casey Alexander, and I think it's an interesting question. At the moment, obviously, as a householder, I can pay Susanna for a service like this one. Um, on the, at the level of scale, well, we got a tweet saying, biggest barrier to municipal food waste composting is the cost. A possible tonnage diverted won't cover new collection costs. Is that part of the problem? Is just that a whole, I mean, you're working with the big, the big, uh, compost producers or the big food waste uh, and food scrap producers right now. But in terms of just mastering this whole cycle, I would imagine there are some real problems uh, about just the cost of picking it all up and getting it where it needs to go. Well, we are targeting the larger scale generators first and because that's the low-hanging fruit. So, so once we get sort of the anchor stores in the mall, so to speak, um, and get these facilities up and running and, and get the infrastructure gap filled, um, the, the prices at the, the tipping fees at these facilities should be less than um, what they're paying now to get their trash disposed. Um, you know, we're, we're paying around probably $65 a ton now for trash disposal and composting or anaerobic digestion should be under that. Um, but once those facilities are built, the municipalities, if, if they choose to participate and separate that out, you know, will need to be some sort of separate collection, um, either a drop-off at a transfer station or, you know, at the curb or, you know, contract out with a service um, such as Susanna's. But 
um, it's all going to have to be worked out. It, it may not be as expensive um, as they think, and they may be able to cut down on the times that their trash is collected. Because if you think about, we're already taking out all of our recyclables, um, and if we get most of the food waste out, what's left is not going to be a whole heck of a lot. So that bucket might not have to be picked up as often as your recycling and your others are too. So it, it might just be a trade-off of what price of one thing going to cover the cost of the other. Hey, Jean Bonnetel, one thing uh, I want to just quickly talk about here, too, is, you know, you heard uh, Susanna kind of coaching me about what I can compost and what I can't compost. But you're kind of working at the outer edges of composting, right? You really, uh, my friend Roy Blunt, the writer, uh, says so every once in a while he'll put like a small pine log in his compost heap, just as he says, to challenge the compost heap, to see what it can do. But you've sort of effectively done that, too, right? I mean, what, what are some of the things that you have been able to compost? We, we compost a lot of different materials. Uh, the defini definition of what can be composted is something that was once alive and is now dead and needs to be managed. So Ralphie essentially could go into the compost <laughs> pile. Um, we compost uh, food processing waste, or we work with companies to, to compost food processing waste, uh, paper fiber, uh, dog food waste, um, we do a lot of mortality waste as well. So we do shelter animals. Mm -hmm. We compost cows, horses, goats, sheep, and we've composted a whale. <laughs> what what prompted you to compost a whale? Was it just the challenge, or well, the whale was in uh, a beach. Uh, whale. Uh, it, the whale was was stuck in fishing equipment, yeah. so uh, an institution was going to take wanted the skeleton, so they composted that. Turned it once physically, uh, mm -hmm. turned the bones physically, not with a big loader or anything, and then they put it back in the compost pile and finished it up. It took about a year mm -hmm. for those bones to become clean bones. Moby heap. Uh, yeah. All right. When so we're composting something like that. It's a very different process. Yeah. So we don't turn those piles. We compost. If we're going to compost roadkill, we'll layer the the deer in the compost pile, mm -hmm. and then we'll leave it for six months. You know, uh, Chris, this is sort of a big shift, I, I think, um, uh, particularly for from what I learned about about your operation too, uh, when Susanna was at my house. Which is, I mean, I've always kind of assumed that compost is organic scraps, you know, is vegetables, is uh, fruits and peels and stuff like that. But she said, no, you you could actually take meat scraps. You could take certain a certain amount of dairy waste, right? Correct. Yeah. And is that sort of because of what Gene's talking about right now, just you know, if the temperatures are, are high enough and the scale is big enough, you can handle that stuff? Correct. Yeah. Also, we don't, we don't have a lot of – at home compost, people are worried about vectors, and we don't have that issue because our, we maintain higher po temperatures in our piles. What's a vector? A vector. It's the thing with an arrow on it. Yeah. No. <laughs> I don't know why they call them vectors, Casey. Do you know? I don't know. They're critters. Oh, critters. <laughs> Critters, flies, bugs, things that shouldn't, that are pesty All right. in, in a compost pile. Those are vectors. All right. Uh, actually, we're going to get into vectors in just a second here. Actually, we'll get into vectors right this second with a call from Barbara in Hartford. Hi, Barbara. Hi, how are you? Just fine. Good. Well, I try to have a compost pile in my backyard, uh, even by blending in the blender all my food scraps and putting it out there, thinking that would keep the critters away, but it did not. So I would like to hear about how to prevent critters from coming in there since my is not as hot as yours. And then also, is there any recovery of the heat from uh, p compost piles that can be turned into electricity? Well, yeah, we were sort of talking about that before, the, the, the second part of your question. That, that's sort of what is being contemplated here is the so-called uh, anaerobic decomposition energy process. But um, so the answer to that is yes. Jean, I'm going to guess you might be the, the closest thing to a vector uh, sure. expert here. So uh, take it away. I will be glad to. Um, if we're composting... Uh, uh, if, if we're composting well, then we're not going to have a problem with the vectors. So we want to have, if we're making a food scrap compost heap, we're going to have a lot of leaves down there. So we're going to put leaves and carbon, so brown materials. And one of the things that we encourage people to use is brown and green materials. And that makes it easier for them to figure out what they need to do. So we put the brown materials down on the base. Then we'll put the green materials. And the green materials would include things like yard waste, or, or grass clippings, but also all the food waste would go in there. And then we would cover it up. So each time we put something that's easily easy to rot, some of the nitrogenous material in there, we're going to make sure it's all covered. So in a compost pile, we should never see the food that's in that compost pile. 
All right. In just a second, you're going to hear a scientist talking a little bit more about uh, vectors. I know that I know I want to call them vectors. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit more about what happens, uh, what kind of wildlife does get interested in your compost heap. Before we do that, just before I don't want to lose this thread here. I, I suddenly realized that we've talked pretty extensively with KC and with Chris uh, about the process of um, of creating the compost, but not about what's done with the compost once it's created. We know that Susanna will bring uh, a small amount of it back to you if you're one of her customers. Wayne uh, Wayne Hanson. This is Wayne. Hanson from the incredibly uh, dangerous area of Sterling, Connecticut, is calling in right now. Uh, Wayne's an organic farmer. And he's got, you've got a question for Chris about uh, the harvest compost, right? Yeah, Go ahead, Wayne. I'm, uh, I'm uh, looking for a compost that is more close to my location than uh, the other side of the, the, road, the, Connecticut, the New York border with Connecticut, which is currently where I have to get it from. Um, I'm trying to figure out if there's some place I'd rather buy it in state, and I'd read, but I wonder if it's approved by either OMRI or the Bay State Organic Certifiers for my use as a certified organic grower. All right, so Chris, answer uh, Wayne's question, and just in general, t- t- talk about where the compost that you ultimately produce, where does it wind up? The compost that we produce is uh, primarily in Ellington, and it's NOFA approved. Hmm. And, and so it's in Ellington, but, um, but who winds up using it? Who, who buys it? It goes to organic farmers. Mm-hmm. It goes to homeowners. It is a component in our Topsoil Plus, which is a high-quality topsoil that we manufacture. It goes to top dressing on athletic fields. Uh, it goes into wetlands reclamation. And it goes into a lot of raised bed gardens, making a lot of great tomatoes. All right, so uh, Casey's way, that goes to your your garden, yep, right? Yep, I your, bought some for my garden. It's great stuff. All right, he's got a bag of it right here. I, I'll be fighting over it yeah. afterwards. All right, so so this whole su- subject of critters or vectors uh, did come up here, and we discovered there's a scientist at Trinity College who's looking at that very question. So uh, let's meet Scott right now. Scott Smedley is an associate professor of biology at Trinity College. Uh, He's been doing compost-related experiments for several years. If you have a compost heap, if you have a compost pile, you're probably vaguely aware that you're not the only person using it. At least you're not the only creature using it. But uh, one of the things that Professor Smedley has done is to try to investigate exactly who else is going to your compost pile, under what circumstances, and for what purpose. So tell us more about this. This involves setting up actually wildlife cameras, right? That's correct. We have a uh, our study site out in eastern Connecticut in uh, the town of Andover, and we're essentially looking at this phenomenon of wildlife visitation to these piles and seeing how varying the material that goes into the pile determines who comes to dinner. So first of all, give me uh, just sort of um, a census uh, of who's going there. We've picked up 33 species wow. so far of birds and mammals. Mm-hmm. Crows are rather common bird visitors, the most common bird visitors. Within the mammal world, um, raccoons mm-hmm. are pretty common, uh, coyotes, gray foxes. I'm not, I'm not hearing deer. I mean, deer seem to get into everything. We do get deer. Our compost piles have vegetable matter going in there, and mm-hmm. sometimes the deer come by to nibble. And also, uh, we cover them with straw. Mm-hmm. It's like you might typically cover the material that you're putting into the pile. We have a straw cover and. Particularly in the winter when pickings are scarce, uh, they'll visit those piles quite often. Are you also seeing any interesting animal behaviors? I mean, just in terms of how they operate, what they do? I mean, obviously some of these animals like raccoons are pretty Mm -hmm. dexterous. Some really neat stuff going on. For example, red-shouldered hawks. You don't typically think of a hawk going to a compost Mm -hmm. pile. But it turns out that they do. They're fairly frequent visitors. But the real interesting thing is two-thirds of the time that they appear, they're in the presence of crows. So it looks as if they're potentially honing in on the crow activity Mm -hmm. to know that, yep, there's something good there at the pile. So it could help their foraging, but it may also help them as they're looking for food to reduce their predation risk. Mm Because with crows, you have a flock. Mm -hmm. And generally, one member in that flock is going to be serving as a sentinel. He's perched, looking around, wary for predators. So it's possible that the red-shouldered hawks also benefit from that extra set of eyes present there as it forages. In terms of just the sheer numbers of visits, I mean, first of all, 33 species, that's a lot. So, um, Mm -hmm. I mean, in terms of just the amount of activity at the compost pile over the course of a night, were you surprised at at just, like, how much of a buffet it is for for how many visitors? (laughs) There are some animals that will literally spend uh, several hours on Mm -hmm. the pile. We have raccoons that actually recline on their backs and and (laughs) dine. (laughs) So they definitely do get a lot of activity. 
All right. So we're talking to Scott Smedley. He's an associate professor of biology at Trinity College doing a study of who visits the compost piles. Is most of this activity nocturnal? It depends. Mm -hmm. During the winter when you get a lot of crow activity, since crows are diurnal, most of the visitation is during the daytime. Shift into the summer and fall, then you get things like raccoons and gray fox and coyote dominating, and therefore is more nocturnal uh, during those seasons. Who's doing all this analyzing? In other words, there's sort of of a lot of um, tape or whatever it is that you wind up with in terms of footage from these wildlife cameras. There are digital images, and you're right. We have literally hundreds of thousands of images coming off these cameras. And we have uh, developed a citizen science tool. I've been fortunate to work um, with some uh, very talented folks in our IT department at uh, Trinity, and we have an online database. And um, the database will serve you up 20 images in a block, You have a pull-down menu that you use to identify them, and uh, each image gets served to five different people. And after we have those five independent viewings, we look for agreement amongst those. If four out of five people or five out of five people say that, yeah, there's three raccoons in that shot, and if it does meet that threshold, we'll accept it. Mm -hmm. And we've gone on to look at those that meet the threshold in our lab, having independent viewers within my research student group, and turns out that, yeah, those images that do reach that agreement threshold typically are accurately identified. Where would they go and find out about this? Where would they go and Uh, and Scavengers.trincall.edu. That will get you to our field guide that introduces you to those 33 critters. You can see um, them in some clear-cut images and some of the more challenging images, which often are the case. You might just get a partial view. The image database is there. That will give you the quiz initially, and then once you pass that quiz... And you can take it multiple times. On average, it takes people about three times to pass it. Once you pass it, you can then actually contribute to our project. That's really great. And we will, by the way, put this link up at WNPR.org if you're interested in learning more about this and maybe becoming one of these uh, citizen uh, scientific observers or analysts. Uh, you can do it that way. So at WNPR.org, we'll have the scavengers link up there. So Scott and Smedley, what do you ultimately want to know about this? In other words, uh, some of this is just probably pure research. You just want to you want to know what you want to know. You want to know what there is to know. Is there anywhere in particular at more of an applied level that this might be going? Yes. As humans influence their environment more and more, and as people begin to look for sort of environmentally friendly and sustainable ways of dealing with solid waste, residential composting is becoming more and more popular. Some areas have municipal programs, but they're few and far between. So generally, you're left to your own, and more and more people are composting. And now this resource has become available to these organisms. How does that affect their ecology? How does this human impact on the environment, potentially alter the ecology of these animals. This is fascinating stuff. And as I say, we will post the link so that other people can get involved. Uh, We'll build up your your army so that you can have even more video cameras and learn even more about this. But Scott Smedley, an associate professor of biology at Trinity College, thanks for joining us today. Oh, you're most welcome. Pleasure to be here. Sometimes at the end of a long day at my stand-up desk, I just like to lie down on my hot compost heap and just let the worms massage my neck. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan and me. Our interns are Jackie Lauper and Anna Novak. The part of Bill Curry was played by Pierce Brosnan. Greg Hill tweets for us at WNPR Colin. For links, articles, videos, and photos of the Faith Middleton Show staff digging through a compost heap for a bottle of Renato Roddy 2006 Marcinosco Barolo, visit our website, WNPR.org. On tomorrow's show, a conversation about comedy on stage. And now... Back to Colin. We've got one more piece of tape we want to share with you, but I also want to say if you're uh, if you've phoned us up right now, we're going to try to use the time that we've got left, and we will have some time left after this uh, to answer your questions and wrap up any more business with our guests. Uh, but right now, we are going to listen to um, some people talk to me, or actually, one person talked to me uh, earlier today uh, about a rather unusual enterprise in Sweden. Susan Vig Masek is a biologist in Sweden. Uh, she is the founder of something called Promesa Organic AB, uh, which is something we wanted to explore. We, as we're talking about compost, obviously, 
One question that popped particularly into the mind of Kion Wolf is, what about us? What about human beings? Is there a way that the, the technology, the chemistry of compost could be applied to our final remains? Susan Vigmasek, this started for you kind of from another venture, right? You started out with a nursery, with a greenhouse, with, with an operation growing vegetables for food. Yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, I have a passion for garden and composting since many years. And um, I just felt that it was a bit sad that what I succeeded to do to bring the rest products from kitchen and garden into a, a wonderful, well-smelling soil within two to three weeks wasn't going to be applicable on us. And, and that was something missing, I think. So you investigated this. And how different is the science uh, of composting human remains from composting what typically becomes soil compost? Um, no, there is no difference at all. I mean, we are organic material. That means that we contain carbon, all of us. So it is more of a habit to see us humans as something separated from nature, but we are absolutely part of nature. So you began thinking about this, I, I think, about 15 years ago and, and talking about it about 15 years ago. How far along are you now? How, how much of a reality is Promesa as a uh, sort of composting burial service? In fact, you are one of the few who knows this, but we are starting to go live next week. Next week. So when you go live, what will happen? In other words, imagine that uh, that someone uh, that I live in Sweden, I think that's probably step one, and that someone that I love has passed on and has requested uh, this means uh, of burial, if that's even the right word. What happens? When we start producing this now for, for our first client, uh, we need uh, approximately 10 months before we can start doing uh, a real treatment. But that is something that we need that long time because it, what we are producing uh, of the technical equipment is, is very specialized. It's an ethical way of taking care of, of our remains. And so, so ultimately, 10 months from now, um, you'll be able to take, I, I guess, a human body, a deceased human body, and place it somewhere. I mean, will it be in just one big, enormous compost pile, or, or is it a different oh, no. process? No, no. No, uh, what is similar or exactly the same is the humus production that is happening in this soil. Mm -hmm. uh, everything else we have adopted to the existing traditions and, and uh, way of, of handling uh, a deceased beloved. So there will be no changes. What we are offering is an improved burial, but also an improved cremation. So you will in the future see our both well-recognized methods, but done in an environmentally friendly way. So so the person will be buried the way a person is always buried, or the person will be cremated the way the person is, is always cremated, but somehow or other that person will then become some kind of humus? Real or, soil. Yeah. Real soil, yeah. And does that involve sort of not embalming the person then? Or, or in other words, what is it that you introduce that creates this final product? What promotion is all about is that we have listened I, from the beginning, I alone. I, I was perhaps a little bit unusual coming from the garden uh, area, trying to find a way to really imitate nature, the way nature took care of our dead bodies from the beginning through the wild animals. What our equipment is doing in a, is, in a way, giving Mother Earth the humus, the teeth that the wild animals had. So what our equipment is doing is allowing the body to go down into small pieces that is going to be dried and separated from the potential metals that we have in our bodies. And that metal-free dried remains is then going to be placed in a coffin in the topsoil where life exists and where our remains could support new life uh, into a plant, into a rose or a, a tree, a family tree or whatever. So, and, and that's where the process ends. In other words, I don't get Uncle Arnie back as a bag of compost, right? No, I mean, absolutely not. I think that it is important that we make this follow uh, a tradition um, and take care of the graveyards that we have. The biggest difference is that the graveyards will not be filled up. Mm -hmm. uh, for overcrowded areas, this is fantastic when the remains is going back to soil within one year approximately. And you can absolutely see in front of you that uh, a favorite tree could be long-lasting for the whole family for generations to come. 
that's a wonderful thing. So in other words, the body goes through your process. Metals are separated out. Whatever is left winds up in the soil, but not in a coffin, not in anything like that. Just It is in a coffin, yes, I'm sorry. It is in a coffin, but it is a totally new. We have the first coffin is, is the similar. We call it the transportation coffin, the one we are used to see today. Mm-hmm. That coffin ends up as wood chips and is blended with the remains into the second coffin, which is the biodegradable coffin that will end up in the topsoil. And together with the remains, that coffin is also going to become part of the soil. So it's a little bit new to learn, but I think that it is going to be extremely appreciated, as we have seen in so many places today. And then will that burial take place in an area that you're administering or in charge of, or can I do this in my backyard? Not in your backyard, because we think that this is really to be looked upon as a dead body, just reshaped and dried. So we need to have graveyards that are used to take care of dead bodies. But we are going to administrate new type of graveyards as well, where you could see it more like a a botanical experience, where you see that this is more of a botanical garden, where you can choose in which part you prefer to rest when your days are, are ending. So I think that it will open for new types of graveyards, but it is absolutely going well into the existing graveyards as well. Well, it sounds, I can tell you that it's very, very appealing to our producer, Kion Wolf. She, I think, wants to be one of your first clients. Uh, but Susan Vig Mosick, thank you so much for taking the time to tell us about Promessa Organic AB. Remember that name. Uh, it's now a reality, and it may be part of your life and death in the future. Thank you for joining us from Sweden. Thank you so much for calling. One of her first clients, but not anytime soon, Kion says. Here's John from Woodbury. I want to cover some questions really quickly. We have very little time left. Alas. Hi, John. You have a question, I think, for yes, Susanna. Thanks. You certainly have a wide-ranging show here. I, uh, I'm learning so much, but I love composting. And, um, and a, a simple question she brought up, I think, early on, the uh, idea of a, of a liner for your compost pail in the kitchen, uh, which is biodegradable. And I sometimes keep my compost at a, a larger bucket. Sometimes it's in there for a month or so. Might might such a bag uh, fall apart before I pull it out? It depends on the sort of bag that you choose. The particular bag I use is bio bag. And what I've realized through testing is typically after about two weeks, it does start to break down. So after about a month, that's probably a little too long for, for your scraps and for that bag to maintain its integrity. So, once again, that's Susanna Castle. She's from Blue Earth Compost. They will come to in Hartford and West Hartford, right, to your house uh, and take your compost away. You can find about that, about more about them online. Here's a um, quick question from uh, Pat in Franklin. I think this might be a Chris uh, Field question. Hi. Hi, Pat. Hi, folks. Uh, great show. Hey, I'm a excavating contractor, and I've got some uh, free time once in a while to, to do, experiment with composting. Um, the biggest problem I've got is uh, finished compost quality and i've accepted some leaves from some local municipalities and i've incorporated uh chicken manure cow manure and i make a great product but the hardest thing i've got is those small things like the uh like the straws and the wrappers and the cigarette butts that are are so fine we can't screen them out and i was wondering if your guests had any advice as far as getting that small stuff out of the finished product so that when you grab a handful you don't see that winston cigarette butt all right. Uh, Casey is um, mimicking just picking them out. Is that about it? Is that Chris, is that his only option? Well, do you screen your finished compost? Oh, I've got to put them back up there for that. I didn't realize you were going to ask a follow-up question. But, uh, yeah, go ahead. You... Uh, the, the screens don't go down fine enough for the, the really small things, like uh, uh, like I said, the small things like wrappers and uh, things that get through that, that half-inch screen. Gotcha. It's possible to have a, a air separator that could get some of it out, but it's – it's, it's it's pretty difficult. It, this is the problem. This is the problem you were talking about before, contamination. Hey, we've got to actually stop right now. We are flat out of time. We had so much ground to cover. We're so lucky to have the people we had. Casey Alexander, Organics Recycling Specialist with the Connecticut DEP. Go on their uh, site to learn a little bit more about their recycling program and about compost. Susanna Castles, I said, from Blue Earth Compost. Chris Field is Vice President of Harvest New England. Uh, they're running a big compost site up in Ellington. And Jean Bonital is Director of Cornell Waste Management Institute in Ithaca, New York. Thanks to all of you. We'll be back tomorrow with comedy, not compost. Yes, we'll all turn to compost by and by.
right, compost heap, it's time for my monthly sample. Mm, garlic skin tastes good. Potato peels feel about right. Hmm. But this apple core has a long way to go. I'll just compost it myself.